The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on uh, one of our very first uh, training session for this upcoming tax season. Uh, we're going to get uh, we're going to cover on how to get started with TaxWise online. It's going to be a live training. And I want to take this opportunity to introduce Ellen Cagle, who is our new trainer here at CIT. Uh, she's got uh, years of experience with TaxWise and various other software. And uh, if you have any questions at all during this presentation, please uh, type them in. We have a huge turnout today, first of all. Just want to make sure everyone knows that. So if you have any questions, please type them in into the GoToWebinar question dialog box. And every now and then, uh, we will pause and answer them for you. And um, you know, it's pretty much the same format. We will also record this and post it to the Facebook group and the YouTube channel. Again, thank you all for joining us, and I'm going to hand it over now to Ellen to go ahead and get started with TaxWise Online. Thank you so much, Omar, for the introduction. And again, welcome to all of our attendees that has taken the time out of their day to be able to sit in on our first training of the year. Um, what we're going to cover today is going to be the administrative features of the program. And even if you are a returning client who's used the online program or a new client who's new completely to the program, I honestly believe that someone today will walk away learning more than what they came into the training to learn. So with that being said, we're going to jump right in and get started. Like Omar said, just to reiterate, if you have questions, type them in as we go. And we'll stop periodically and answer some of them. And definitely at the end, we will go through as many as we possibly can. So with that said, let's go to the screen. So you'll, if you'll notice, I'm at the client login screen. So when you click on the link, it's going to take you here. Your client ID is required to be able to log in, as well as you being the administrator, the name that you'll log in with is going to be admin. Now, if it is the first time you are logging in to the system for the year, the password is going to be the registration code. And that's all provided to you in the email that we send you once we get the program activated for you. After you set up this information and you log in, it's going to prompt you automatically to change that password. So they want you to change it to something that you're familiar with. Now, of course, some of the requirements that you have to use when you're creating this password is listed there on the right-hand side. It would want you to let you know that you need to make it at least eight characters long. It cannot exceed 100 characters, and of course, it wants you to have a number and some special characters and other things. But again, it'll list it out there for you what you have to have in the password when you create it. So once you are in and you've put in all your information, the program wants to know that you're not a robot. So you have to verify that you are a person sitting there seeing these images and you have to select these images in order to prove that you are a human. So for this one, it's asking me to pick out all the bridges. So we simply come through here and select all the images in which you see a bridge in. Once you do so, you can simply click on verify if you get them all, it lets you know it puts the check mark beside it, and we know that you're not a robot, and it'll allow you to then log in. So once you do that, simply click on Log In, and it'll take you into your dashboard. Now, the dashboard is going to be the landing page. So when you first log into the program, this is where you're going to land. Um, as you can see here, there's lots of different things that you can access from here. You could go to tax returns. This will display any tax returns that you have started already. E-filing, when you're ready to start electronically filing those prepared tax returns, you would go into that tab and then reports. 
And we'll come back and talk about some of these a little later in the program. But what we really want to focus on today is that administrative side of things. How do you get everything set up to make sure that your office runs as smoothly as possible? Adding users, creating different roles for those users to be able to do, um, those things. So to access that, what we're going to do is up in the top right-hand corner, you'll see Administrator. And if you click on it, it's going to give you a drop-down list. This will be the easiest way for you to log out of the program if you need to log out or also access those settings that we need to get to to get set up. So once I click on settings, it's going to take me into our settings tab. And as you can see here on this page, we have several different sections in which we can go in and set up the pertinent information that you need to enter to run your office effectively and efficiently as possible. So the first section we're going to look at is going to be underneath these general settings. And once you click that, it will display it. Now the first settings that you come to are going to be those user settings. This is where you put in the tax preparer information with their PTINs and all that, as well as the EROs. But this is not where we suggest you do this. And the reason being is this. So if you'll notice here on these sections that it's got a lot of the information that the IRS requires, right? The P10, the firm name, city, state, zip, the preparer's ID, but something that it's not asking for here that we also have to have when you're doing bank products is information that's relevant, relevant to the bank that you're working with. So, for example, we know that with Republic, you had to have an RB number, right? Well, this screen does not allow you to enter that information in. So, what we suggest here at Community Income Tax is that you do that piece and set all that up information up in the return templates. So, the templates that you create that keeps you from having to enter information over and over and over again, that is where we are going to suggest for you to be able to go in and set this information up. And we will come to that. It will be in the next section that we actually cover. But below that setting, you have some other administrator settings. And a really good setting that I like to talk about here is these custom fields. And what these custom fields give you as EROs the ability to do is require that your preparers are getting more information from the client than then maybe that was required. So if you look here, you can see I've already added like three examples here. So the first one being add the client to a mailing list. So we want to know if our clients want to receive income. You know, if we can get them our mailing stuff from us, so if we can get them on a mailing list, what that does for you as the administrators and the owners of these offices is you get that customer's information and you can mail them out info uh, through email or snail mail if that's what you choose. What does that do for you? That keeps you in front of your client all year long. Okay, so you could do birthday mailing lists, things like that. If the customer agrees to that, then throughout the year they can get that special, oh gosh, my preparer thought about me feeling because you added them to your mailing list. So to show you how this field works, if you simply click on the pencil beside the field that you're wanting to add an additional question, once you do that, it will take you in and this is where you can put in your custom questions. So, for example, let's say that um, you want to know who referred them or were they a referral. Once you put that in, then it wants you to have some pick values. Well, for this one, we're just going to say, yes, they were referred. 
or no, they weren't. So that'll be the two options. So if they say yes, then we know we need to get more information to them, like who actually referred the client to come to you. Now, I want you to note, too, on your question, you can't have any special characters or any kind of values, and it has to stay at at least 25 characters or lower, because if not, it's not going to fit on the form. But once you create it, you can simply click on Save and Close, and then it will actually add that to your custom fields, and it will be listed there. Now, what that does is when your preparers are completing these tax returns, they have to ask those questions if you have it marked that it is a required field, that something has to be answered there. If you don't, they can skip it and they don't have to answer it. Now, one of the things, too, I like to point out here is you see we have 14 different fields. So you could have had 14 different prepare use field. But I also ask that you use caution when you're creating these because if you did create 14 and made all of them required, that's going to cause a lot more work and take a little more time to complete that return. So maybe just use it for the more important things that you really, really need to know about your client. The next section is going to be the return stages. Now this is another great way to get information out without having to open up a return. So a good example is someone's come in, that you've done their tax return, and then they realize, oh no, I, I'm still waiting on a W-2, so I can't send this yet. Well, you can create a waiting on W-2 return stage, and what that does is it gives you the, the preparers the ability to say, this is the return stage it needs to add to, and whenever you're looking at your return list, there's a stage line so you can see that. So instead of having to open up a return to try to figure out why it hasn't been electronically filed yet or, or why it's still sitting there, that return stage can tell you exactly why that tax return has not been electronically filed yet. And it makes it easy because you can look at it all down in a straight list down all your returns and not having to open up each one of those returns to try to figure out why they've not been transmitted yet. Next is going to be your print sets. So in this program, we have three different print sets you can choose from. You have your primary forms. And basically what your primary forms will do is it's going to print out all the completed federal and state forms. Now keep in mind it's not going to print out the main information sheet. That's not a required form. It's not going to print out an interview sheet or worksheets for that matter. Just the required federal and state forms that have been completed will print. The next is going to be completed forms. So if you want in all the forms to print, which would include the main information sheet, any worksheets, any interview sheets, you would want to mark that one. And again, just keep in mind, the key word here is completed sheets. It's not going to just print out everyone that's in there. It's only going to print out the ones that pertain to the return, are being used, and are completed. And then the last section is <coughs> signature forms. So anything that has to have a signature from the taxpayer and or the ERO will print. Okay, so anything from bank forms to federal forms to state forms, those forms will print if this is selected. Now you also have the ability to create your My Print Set, so you can create your own as well as for state print sets. The next section is going to be advanced. And what this advanced section does for you is certain roles that you have see listed below here don't have the rights to override fields. And, and it really is by design set up properly. Um, you shouldn't be overriding fields. But if you needed to give a certain preparer's the ability to override, 
you can come through here and say, okay, my interview person can override a field, my return preparer can, and my reviewer can. But I suggest you use warning whenever and, and caution whenever you're doing this because there has to be a deeper issue as to why someone's going to have to override a field because the program calculates automatically. So what I would suggest is having maybe someone in your office that um, has a little more longevity in the program to be able to look at the return to find out why she thinks the field needs to be override. Or you can even contact us and we can take a look at the return and to see what the problem is and why they feel like the entry that's calculated into that field is not correct and that would need to be overridden. So again, just use this as precaution because 99.9% .9 of the time, the program really doesn't need to be overridden. It just needs to be looked at to see where and what the, film, the, the field is carrying into that section. Now carry forward templates. If you used the program last year and you had any templates that you have already created, if you would like to bring them forward, you have the ability to do so from this screen. The last section here, um, salutations. Now, we have the Miss, Ma'am, Doctor, all those salutations already into the system for you. But if you're maybe in a community that has a lot of um, Spanish clients, you could come in here and add, say, maybe a senorita, you know, all the other salutations that the other ethnic groups use, you could come in here and build that list yourself and add them. Now, once you've completed with all of your general settings on this particular screen, you'll see a save and close down at the bottom. So that's all you have to do is simply click on save and close and any of the changes that you have made in there will save. The next area underneath the general settings that we're going to talk about is going to be the manage users. Now this is a very, very important piece to talk about. Um, when you're creating and adding users, this is where you're going to do so. So you'll see the very first link up at the top is create new. You have add change admin messages, you have show inactive users, so if you have people that say logged into the system or they say they're logged into the system, you can click on that and it'll show you anyone that is currently logged in at that particular time. Repeat, re restrict IP address. Now, what a lot of our customers do ask is, hey, I don't want anyone to be able to log in to the program outside of my office. Well, Hands down, this is not the best way to do so, and here is the reason why. A lot of people restrict IP addresses, and what happens is when they're trying to log in from their computer, even at the office, it can create issues. So what I always suggest to, to anyone that I'm talking with or going through a training class with is if you're not wanting your clients or your, your preparers to be able to log in from outside of the office, just at the end of the day, just come in and you can mark users inactive. That way, they can't log in from anywhere else. But you're not getting into the headache of restricting an IP address that could, in the future, cause you a lot of problems. So when you're ready for them to be able to come back in and do returns again, you can simply mark, you know, activate all users again. So let's talk about some of the roles that you can assign. So let's add a new user. So to create a new user, I simply click Create User. Now up here at the top, it'll show you how many licenses that you have, how many licenses you have already assigned to users, as well as how many unassigned licenses you have left. Now you have unlimited amount of licenses. It does start off at 10. So if you 
reach that number of 10 and decide that you need more, that is no problem. Pick up the phone, give us a call, and we can definitely get you some more licenses so you can create different logins for other users that you may need to. The username, it's all up to you on how you want to create the username in your offices. A lot of times people use the first name, last initial. They may use last name, first initial. It's completely up to you. So for this example, I'm just going to do Ellen or Kegel E. And then put in the real name. It's going to be Ellen Kegel. And then the email address. And that email address is really important because that's how they're going to get their email to let them know that their user has been set up and created and it'll give them a link they can be able to click on to take them to the login screen. Now another thing I like to point out when I'm talking about this is when you're creating users, the very first time you create that user, their password is going to be the same thing as their username. Okay, so when they're logging in, the username will be there, then they create the password, and it's, when they type in the password, it's going to be the same as their username. Once they do that, the program will take them in automatically to a screen that will prompt them to change to their long-term password, okay? But the first time they log in, username is the same as what the password will be the first time. So then you want to put in their email address, of course, because that's where they'll get the notification. Then you see this here is active user. If you don't mark that they're an active user, they're not going to be able to log in because the program thinks that they're not active. So you want to make sure that that check mark is there. By default, it does put it there, but you just want to make sure that it stays there because if it's not marked as active, they won't have access to log in. Below that, you have the two different columns. You have possible roles, so this is what they possibly could do, and you have assigned roles. Whenever you first add a user, the only role that's going to be automatically assigned is going to be return prepare. But please note, make big note of this, that in order for them to be active, they must have licensed user added to assigned role. Now we have asked and requested for that to happen automatically since it's required and we hear that they're working on it, but I you know, don't know the exact time frame. But in order for them to be active and able to access the system, that active user role must be checkmarked, and they also have to have licensed user under their assigned role. This will create lots of phone calls to us because they add their users and they didn't assign licensed user to them. So just make note of it that licensed user must be assigned underneath the assigned roles or they will not have access. Now there is lots of other possible roles listed out here and I want you to know that in the user manual I get there is a complete section on the users and the user roles and what each individual role give them access to. So if, for example, we're going to say this new person that we are creating this for is simply going to be kind of like a super user. They're going to be able to do everything, okay? They're going to be able to start their return. They're going to be able to e-file their own return, things like that. So what I would give them so they could do all of this would be, of course, Return prepare, it's listed there. I would also want to make sure they have eFile Manager because if they don't have that, they cannot access anything to do with eFiling the tax return. Let's say they're even going to print their own checks. We can add that as well. Okay, so they, are, they have the return prepare so they can ret prepare their return. They have the license user so they can access the program. 
they have the ability to go into the e-file manager and e-file said return, and they also have the ability to print a check for that return. So with all that, they should be able to do any and everything that they need to do to be able to prepare that tax return. So once I add this person, I simply click Save, and I have just created my other user and gave them the appropriate roles needed for them to be able to do their tax returns. Now we are going to be creating some more videos that we are going to have put out on our YouTube channel and as well share links out on our Facebook page. So we will do a lot of videos and be able to go into more depth on some of these things that you guys you guys may have questions on. So this is just kind of a quick overview just to show you some of the things that you as administrative people will have the access to do. Ellen? Uh-huh. Uh, I, 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 sorry to, to stop you here, but we've been getting a lot of questions uh, while you were going over these roles, so I just want to kind of, uh, you know, cover them here just so we're all on the same page. I've been uh, answering as much as I can. Um, okay. So the first thing is, um, you know, Irma asked, is, uh, is there a way for other users to work with the returns I create? And that is obviously yes. Uh, if you give them that specific uh, permission. So um, they have to be a licensed user, a return preparer, and also have access to uh, either a super user access or uh, an access to view other returns, which you can do that in the client manager. Okay. So, so, and then the second one here is, um, uh, Vaughn asked, can I assign an individual to just print checks, nothing else besides a licensed user? And obviously, I, I went ahead and pre-answered it, and I said yes, and I'm pretty sure that's the right answer, correct? I do believe so, yes. Yes, there is just a check print or mm -hmm. option. So, yes, if you have somebody who is all they're going to do is print checks, they need to have licensed user and check printer. Correct. All right, go ahead. That was just a couple of things that I just wanted to bring up. And everyone, hey, if you have any questions, I've been trying to answer them as quickly as I can. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll stop every now and then to answer some more. So, But please ask us the questions. It will help us with more training. Oh, exactly. If there's anything out there that you guys would love to see either a, a webinar on or even a pre-recorded training video, um, any feedback you guys can provide to us, um, we will be able to put together those things and have that easily accessible to you at your fingertips at any time you need it. If you're training someone at midnight and we're not in, you can still have access to those videos. So definitely any and all feedback on the types of trainings you would love to see come your way, let us know. Okay, moving right along. The next option that we're going to take a look at is going to be return templates. Now this is where I said when we were talking about underneath the general settings they're entering in the preparer information as well as the ERO information that we don't suggest that you do it there. And the reason being is that it gets and captures all the IRS information that they need but it does not capture the banking info that they need, okay? Like I said, certain banks are requiring each preparer to be able to pass a test in order to be able to even offer bank products. And once they do take said test, they get assigned a number. So this is kind of our workaround for how it's going to make it easier on you as the office administrators. It's going to be to put it in the return template section, okay? So if you look, you see here on my return template section, I have my default. This is for all of my offices, my default community income tax template. So if I open up this and I show you, I'm simply going to click on the edit so we can actually go in and look at some of the information that I want to carry to every single return that gets started from this point forward. Okay. So if you started returns before you created your return template, it's not going to go back and change those. It will only affect said returns created from this point forward. 
So this wants to be, you want this to be the, one of the first things that you do when you're setting up your offices. So if we come down through here and look, you'll notice that one of the main things that I wanted to have populate in every return that I create is a bank. So I will want to mark bank products as I want them to be in every return and the banks that I'm going to be using. So we're going to say for this bank, it's going to be Republic Bank, okay? And then down here at the bottom of your main information sheet is where you want to put in your preparer information. So for this example, I'm going to put in my initials, EKC, because it's going to be for me, the paid preparer. And then I'll put in my name, my Peton, the firm that I'm working for, the address, and then the zip code. Now, when I hit tab, you'll notice that it does not automatically populate the city and state, okay? But once I click on Save Changes, when it refreshes that return, you'll notice that it does put in the city and state for you. So that's, again, saving you those keystrokes. It's going to automatically populate for you. Then, of course, you want to put in the email address. If you have the, your EIN, you'll put in your EIN information and a telephone number. Those are the only other two required fields. And then now, this information would carry over to every single tax return. Okay? So what I want to do now is I'm going to actually go back to my return templates because you know you've seen our default information, but this is the one where you want to put in it for each preparer. So you can create your preparers and base it off of the default CIT template, okay? So once you do that and you go in, to their default template, you'll see there's the preparer's info, but it also, if we go to the bank app piece, and I can show you here, it pulls in their information as well. Here's the preparer's PTIN that pulled in, but also that bank identification number, that RBIN number that you get if you're using Republic Bank. If you'll note, if you remember, if we went back over here to settings and we go here to prepare information, we showed you that it had the place for the PTIN, but there's nowhere in here to put in any banking information. So that's why we suggest leaving these blank and just doing them in the return template mode. That way, you can create your default template for your office and then you can use that default template to create it for your preparers. And the only information you would have to change in there would be their preparers information at the bottom of the main information sheet as well as the bottom of the bank app. Now, one other thing, too, that you can actually do in your default template is your pricing. So, for example, you can come in here and put all the pricing that you need. You know, for this one, I just did an example of like $150 for our 1040 return. And another one I like to point out here is because, you know, it's only a $15 fee for the product that you send through to us. You're not being charge any of those other ungodly amounts of fees from the other software companies that is going to charge you a transmission fee, a e-filing fee, and all your fees. You guys have $15, and we always suggest that in order to make sure that you're, a company, you're, you're acquiring that $15, is to simply go in here and put in the $15 
e-filing fee on the e-file fee section in the default. Now once you enter in the information here on your pricing sheet, the great thing to note here is you can lock this pricing sheet. So if you do not want your preparers to be able to go in there and make any changes, if you lock it, they cannot change any of the pricing. This is huge to a lot of folks who do not want their preparers to go in and make any changes. So just know you have that ability as well. But once you create these for all your preparers and you have them and they have their, their banking information into it as well, you simply click Save and Close and it will keep that information and you've, you can assign it to that user and when they log in, their information pulls automatically to the returns that they start. So any questions, Omar, on the return templates? Uh, no questions specifically on the return templates. I think there were just a little bit of a confusion why uh, we want everyone to have their own template. And just uh, for, for those who were with us last year, I guess it's mostly for newer officers who haven't joined us, is that we are, you know, most of our returns are bank product returns. If your most of your returns are not bank product return, then you use the regular feature in tax and just set up a wheel that using uh, making a template for every user and filling in all the banking information and the ARBIN information and all that stuff gives you more flexibility and it just makes more sense. Uh, we've it will cut down your time and the goal is to cut a, cut down as much time as you can on, on the return. Um, so, um, but other than that, I think you did a, a pretty good job covering it here. Um, and I guess, stop, I guess the next time you stop, we'll go more questions. Okay, wonderful. Back into our settings. The last one we're really going to cover in here is going to be the client letter template. And back in the day, client letters were very, very, very confusing. Um, they wanted you to select different variables and how you created it and what you're pulling. You didn't know the information. So this is really streamlined things a lot. So for example, to make a new client letter template, you simply click on new template. Now here's the, the cool thing that we give you the ability to do. We give you the ability, when you're creating your new template, of course, you're going to name it. So for this one, we're going to simply name it Georgia Location. And below that, you have an option. You can either A, create your own client letter with a blank template, or you can start with an existing client letter. So the client letters that we've already made and is already in your tax returns are already in your program, you can edit that. So you don't have to recreate the wheel. Why recreate the wheel when the base and the frame is already there for you? Simply modify it. So for this one, I'm going to show you how easy it is to modify. So let's simply say that they are having a 1040 return and it's going to be a refund return. I can simply select Underneath my predefined templates, it's a 1040 refund letter. And once I click on Create Template, it's going to take me in there and it's going to show me what is already listed out there for you. Okay? But you can go in and you can change any of the verbiage throughout this client letter. Okay? Now you'll notice here where we have the special field. That is the information that will pull in based on the return that it's being added to. So if you didn't want all of this information to populate up here, you can simply take it out. You know, say, I don't want to know their address. I don't want their address, city, state, and zip to print on here because I'm just, they're walking out of my office with it. You could actually delete these fields here and they will not print and pull that information in if you wanted to add an additional letter or an additional section, you have that ability as well. Once you've changed it to however you want your client letter to read, all you have to do is simply click on Save. 
Now once you click on Save, you've saved every change that you've made. But now when you go to Close, it's also going to bring you up another dialog box, which some people think, oh no, it's not saved my changes. But if you read it, it says you'll lose any changes made since your last save. Well, we just have saved it, so there's nothing it's going to lose, so you simply click on OK. And you've just created your client letter template and have the information in there that you wish to have put in that letter. You've just simply edited one of the client letters that was already created for you. It's that easy. So once you're completed here, you can simply click back here on settings and go back to your settings. Okay. Now the last little piece that we're going to cover in today's training is going to be some on the reporting. Now there's a couple of different ways that you can get reports using the program. Okay. You can click on the reports tab here and we display six reports for you. Now there is a place in the program, I mean, you can access 27 different reports. And the other reports seem to be a little more in depth, not only because you're able to select the ones you want and export that to Excel, but it also gives you the ability to look year over year. So if you use the program a couple of years, you can do year over year reporting as well. So, but to access those reports, all you really need to do is go to support.taxwise.com and you'll log in with it, but it's the same login information that you use to access your program as well, okay? So now let's say you found a report that you are wanting to run and let's just say we're going to pull a birthday report. So you'll find the report you want to run and you simply click on generate. Now once you click on generate, you'll see underneath the status it tells you new. It also gives you a time and date stamp. So it lets you know the exact day and time which you ran this report. But to get to the Excel download file, all you need to do is refresh. Because when you refresh that, that's when it's going to build that report. So once I click on refresh, you can see here it's now got my link that I can click on and when I do so it's going to download that link and if you look down in the bottom left hand of my corner of my screen here you'll see bank refund settlement report so once I click on that it'll actually bring it up now just to go ahead and tell you we're in a demo software, so we do not have any return. So I don't want you to think, oh, no, it's not working. It didn't pull in any information. That's because I don't have any information for it to pull. But with this said, too, now you have all the functionality to manipulate this report that you do with Excel in general. You can sort by column. For example, if you wanted to sum up all the the money from the people that you've been completing returns for, you have that ability as well. So you can do any of the functions that you have accessible to you in Excel. So and that is really what we planned on covering today. Um, Omar, is there any further questions? I think, yeah. I, I mean, it's not a question more than a comment that I want to jump in. And I think uh, based, on, based on some of my experience with a lot of our EROs last year, um, I feel like this was an unutilized option for a lot of people. It's a really got a lot of good, powerful reports on there. You can check, uh, check print reports, uh, manager employees, you know, a, a lot of good stuff in there. So, you know, get in the habit of, um, going to the support side at tax wise. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, and those reports are pretty powerful. So thank you for bringing that up. Ellen. But that, that, that's it. Um, I think uh, the biggest question I'm getting is, will business be added to online? Uh, we have not gotten the answer yet, but we should have an answer soon uh, on the newest version of the software. So we'll, we'll let you guys know about that. Uh, we're expecting sometime in October, I think, is when the software comes out uh, online. So, 
Uh, also, just to uh, fo follow up, we are keep an eye to your email. We're going to continue doing these webinars and a lot of great, exciting new announcements that we are sharing. We'll be sharing with you very soon. <laughs> so, uh, this webinar will be recorded for everyone who asked and will be posted on YouTube as well. Ellen, uh, you can go ahead and take over. Um, let me see. Uh, will business? I uh, have to see this recorded. Uh, uh, one more uh, signature. Yeah, online signature will be available on the uh, project next year. That is, but it uh, looks like that's all the questions we have. Please go back to the Facebook group. Tell us what you think. Email us. Let us know what you want us to cover. And we're going to continue uh, doing these webinars. Huge turnouts. Thank you so much, everyone. I was really surprised about how many people turned out here. So it looks like uh, we're, we're definitely going to keep doing these and, and having you guys be a little more comfortable in the future with the software. That's our goal here. Wonderful. And thank you guys for welcoming, in, welcoming me in to the Community Income Tax family. And I look forward to being able to bring lots more training to you. Give us your feedback. Let us know what you want to see, and we will do our best to get that out there for you. All right. Let's go ahead and close this down. Thank you, everyone, again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.